Hello and welcome to this episode of Mystery Made Known, a video channel about all things Jesus and the Gospel. In this video we're asking what is God really like? And you know what? Turns out he's better than you think. When I was a young lad I was taken regularly to church my young mind was fascinated by many things, especially this little cupboard sized door halfway up the centre of the wall behind the altar at the front of the church. It looked a lot like our classic 1960s serving hatch between the kitchen and dining room at home. I would watch with fascination at the beginning of the service as the priest unlocked the door with a key around his neck then took out all these shiny clean metal table objects, a chalice sort of holy grail thing, a small shiny plate and bowl, a shiny container holding communion wafers and a couple of glass jugs, one to take the wine and the other water. And they were all covered with bright clean white cloths. Then at the end of the service, the priest would reverse the deal, meticulously clean all the bits and pieces and ceremonially put them back through the little door in the wall. One day I asked my dad what was on the other side of this little door? Where did it lead to? <laughs> now, whether this is what my dad actually said, I don't know, but this is what I heard. That's the tabernacle and it's where God lives. <laughs> Well, two things struck my simple little mind. The awesome idea of that here in our little church was a portal to heaven with angels or even God himself passing things through the hatch to us from the other side like my mum did at home. No wonder the priest treated them with such respect and cleaned them so diligently. The second thing I thought was, well, the door was obviously too small for God to get through to us or for us to get through to him. But he's put the priest in charge as he's got the key to work out who can go wh where through the door. <sighs> Isn't it funny how our views of what God's like can be formed and shaped? How plausible they seem so often. So when it comes to thinking about what God's like, who he is, what he's up to and what he thinks about us and all that stuff, church, Christianity, Jesus, we're all really in the same boat. We all came out of the womb knowing nothing about it at all. So all our opinions and attitudes are pieced together, all of our understanding, simply through what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've experienced, what we've been told. I stopped attending church in my early teens, yet I would say that I had some pretty firm opinions about what God is like, who he is, what he's up to and what he thought about me. Now I can see how absurd my understanding was, yet despite all the Sunday service attendance, all the Sunday school classes, despite all the ceremonies and rituals, the Holy Communion, confirmation, despite all that. I still managed to form and carry around a distorted picture of what God is like for years. I think that I'm just representative of millions of people inside and outside of the church who for one reason or another have picked up a distorted picture of God. But so often our ideas of God couldn't be more different from the truth. In the Bible it says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, Jesus, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So it's not surprising then to find Jesus sorting out this very problem through what he taught, to correct wrong ideas about who God is and what he's like and what he's up to and what he thinks about us all. There is one particular parable story that he told just for this very purpose, to enable those of us inside or outside the church to see the truth about God. So the scene for this story is this. Jesus is hanging out as he usually did with those referred to as 
sinners and tax collectors. Let's just call them rebels. Those who have chosen to turn away from God and pursue a life apart from him. Jesus is talking to them about what God's really like. But there's a second group of people there too listening in, the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Let's call them simply the religious leaders. Now, they despise these rebels for their outrageous, ungodly way of life, but also criticise Jesus for associating with them. Jesus said, God is like the father in a story who has two sons. One day, the youngest son asks the father for his inheritance. Pretty outrageous, seeing dad was still alive, but... The father agrees and divides all he has between his two sons. In a short time, the youngest son is up and off to a far off country and blowing all his money on wine, women and song. A famine hits this far off country and he ends up tending somebody else's pigs just to survive <laughs> and envious of what the pigs was eating were eating because it was better than what he was getting. And it's pretty unclean for a Jew to be around pigs too. He finally comes to his senses, wakes up and reasons that being one of his father's servants would be better off than this. So he sets off for home with his hope. But his father sees him in the distance and is so stoked he runs to meet him. Apparently it's a pretty undignified thing for the father to do to run. So the son meets him, blurts out his well-rehearsed speech, repenting for what he's done and asking to join the servants quarters. The father just says, get my best stuff for him. Robe, ring, sandals, cook up a celebration meal and let's party. My son was dead, but now he's alive. Lost, but now found. Now the other son enters the story. He's been diligently working hard in the fields and when he comes towards the house, he hears the party and learns that his brother's home and that dad's stoked and has broken out his dancing shoes. So. The older brother gets a strop on and boycotts the party. Dad comes out to try and change his mind. The older brother blurts out all his anger and all the obvious stuff. Younger brother's done all this rebellious, outrageous stuff and he gets the party. And I've slaved after you all these years, done all the obedient, diligent stuff, but never got my own party. And the father simply replies, you've always had all my stuff access to it all the time. It's around you. But your brother had turned away, lost his way, and so to speak was dead to us. But now he's found and alive. So what is Jesus telling us about what God's like through this story? first thing to notice, and the main point that Jesus is making, is that neither of the sons really knew their father. Both expected him to respond negatively to the son's return, and both sons were surprised by his positive response. Now remember the audience, the rebels, sinners and tax collectors, they thought that life without God was the best way to live, and anyway, they were hopeless cases well beyond redemption they would have been surprised by the father's gracious response. Why? Because the second group, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, who claimed to know God, had told the rebels and repeatedly told the rebels that they had to do it their way, keep all the rules and regulations that God gave to gain God's favour. But these religious leaders would also have been surprised at the father's gracious response. So here we have Jesus letting his audience realise that they really don't know about God at all. They have formed plausible but distorted views of God, something Jesus came to correct. So what is the Father like? The first thing to see and understand is this. The Father gives the sons the freedom to choose their way of doing life. For the first son, the youngest son, the rewards of life were to be achieved through a life apart from the father, hoping to find satisfaction in the apparent freedom of doing whatever you like, and certainly money would help out with that. For the older son, the rewards of life were to be achieved through disciplined, obedient service. Neither son asked 
advice from the father on what life's all about, but assumed that they knew what was best and pursued it. So the father, at real cost to himself, allows them, both sons, to freely pursue their chosen paths. The second thing to see is that the father is delighted to share everything he has with both his sons, not because they've earned or deserve it, but because of their status as his sons. The father may have treated his servants very well indeed, but his sons had a higher status and turns out already had full access to all of his possessions. Everything they thought that their lifestyles would eventually earn them, they already had. They didn't realise this, that they already had it. Both sons appear to misunderstand their status of who they were, didn't realise their true identities and assumed what we might call a servant mentality. After the younger son loses everything, he returns thinking that joining the father's servants was the best thing he could hope for. The older son had a similar understanding, but from a slightly different perspective. His best hope was to gain the father's approval and blessings from serving him as an obedient servant. The third thing we see is that in all of this, the father's overriding priority was the joy of restoring life to his sons. This particular story is the third and most detailed out of three lost and found stories. The other two are about finding a lost sheep and a lost coin. In each case, there is a great celebration when what was lost is found and restored. In the case of the lost sheep and coin, Jesus says there is literally partying in heaven over every person who wakes up to God and turns back to him. However, the fourth thing to notice isn't what is present in the story, but what Jesus purposely leaves absent from the story, anger and punishment. So, I suspect we all have some sense of the need for justice, which includes somewhere in their anger and punishment. In Jesus' story, the two sons expected it, and so would have those listening to the story. And I suggest you and I expect it as well. After all, this is the deal we live with. Break the rules, expect anger somewhere in the mix, and take the punishment like a rat. I suggest that this is the conventional picture of what God is primarily like. The arbiter the upholder of justice against breaking the rules. And yet, while Jesus has some stern stuff to say about God's anger and judgment elsewhere, here he intentionally leaves it out of the discussion. In fact, and ironically, the only anger found in this story is found in the older son. He's not only angry with his brother for not obeying the rules, but also angry with the father for not endorsing them. So the religious leaders get a warning shot across their bow. If they think about God simply in terms as a rule endorser and keeper, then they have the distorted view of the older brother of, of God. Jesus here exposes them as their own kind of rebels, religious rebels if you like. Likewise, and also ironically, the only thing that looks anything like punishment in this story is self-inflicted. The younger son inflicts upon himself all the consequences of his chosen lifestyle away from the father with all of its shame and eventual poverty. While the older brother suffered self-induced isolation as he boycotts the celebration and also suffers the harsh consequences of graceless anger and unforgiveness. Jesus makes it quite clear in these three lost and found stories that heaven is on the side of celebration, on the side of grace and forgiveness as its priority. Now it's not good practice to read too much into a single story and the best way to grasp the gospel message of the Bible is to allow all of the teaching to shape our understanding of any individual part that makes it up. So how do we do justice to the emphasis Jesus himself is making in this story about what God is really like, who he is, what he's up to, and what he thinks about us all? Well, 
Jesus reveals that God's highest priority, his ultimate aim, is restoration, which can only happen through love and grace. Whatever important part the satisfaction of justice plays in all of this, the thing God is really going after is the joy of rescue, restoration, forgiveness, reconciliation. This is the aim and goal of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in all they do to make all things new through the great sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the great price paid like the Father paid in the story. In fact, the Bible teaches that it's God's kindness that is intended to lead us to repentance, wake us up and turn us back towards him, which this story illustrates so well. Jesus here warns the rebels that their chosen ungodly lifestyle will never deliver what they hope for. But he also warns the religious leaders the same thing. Their chosen lifestyle and understanding of God will also never deliver what they hope for. In both cases, there is distorted views of what God is like, who he is, what he's up to and what he thinks about us. The Gospel story is all about exposing our misunderstandings about God and indeed our misunderstandings about ourselves and identities. So what is God really like? Simple. He is identical to Jesus. As somebody has said, there is no shadow of a different God lurking behind Jesus. What you see is what you get. The New Testament makes it absolutely clear that Jesus is the most complete and full revelation of who God is, what he's like, what he's up to, and what he thinks about us all. I mean, Jesus himself says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And it's good news. In fact, it's tidings of great joy for the whole human race. He's for us, not against us. He so loves us that while we were still rebels, even religious rebels, Jesus came to take the rap, to set us free from our misguided lives, from our distorted views of God, however plausible they might be to us. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, of which we're all included. This story warns us about making life choices based on distorted views of God. To the rebels, Jesus says, can't you see Everything you're pursuing in the far off country is not found in turning away from God, but towards him. To the religious rebels, he says, rules are only a means to an end. Don't make them the main point. I mean, elsewhere, Jesus warns the religious leaders, they're way off target prioritizing rigorous obedience at the expense of forgiveness and grace. He quotes the Old Testament twice. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Of course, all of us are in danger of falling into either camp with a distorted view of God. We may think life is better off without God or that his way is all about rules and regulations. The coming of Jesus is the Father searching for us, ready with the symbols of being his sons and daughters, the ring, the robe, the sandals, the celebration party. Jesus is the Father inviting us out of the distortion of dead religious practice into the celebration fueled by forgiveness and grace. If you like, Jesus is the third brother who knows what the Father is really like and leads us back, the whole family back, to the Father's side. So I wonder what your views of what God is like, who he is, what he's up to and what he thinks about you. I wonder if you can identify with either of the sons in the story. I wonder if, like me, you've formed a distorted idea about God that seems plausible, but in the end doesn't look anything like Jesus. Well, I pray that God, through his Spirit, will sort out any distorted ideas you have about him. 
I pray that you will discover your true identity as a child of God with all of the blessings that that understanding brings with it. I pray that you will be able to turn away from anything in your life that keeps you from receiving the love of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And I pray that you will indeed come to understand, know and rejoice in the truth of what God is really like and that you'll see he's better than you ever dreamed of. Uh-huh.